Hola, ¿qué tal? Bienvenidos a Vidas. Hoy vamos a conocer a un verdadero maestro del cine italiano, Mario Bava. En una época cuando muchos deseaban un cine moralizador, con temas como el amor, la vida familiar y la amistad, Mario Bava surgió como el creador de imágenes violentas, eróticas y de terror. Él no consiguió en vida la fama que otros tuvieron, pero por su influencia y por su estilo ha sido comparado con Alfred Hitchcock. Bava fue el precursor de cintas de terror como Viernes 13 y Halloween, de películas de ciencia ficción como E.T. y Alien, y también de escenas violentísimas como las de Quentin Tarantino en Reservoir Dogs. Vamos a conocer a este maestro y su legado en vida. Before people knew what cult movies were, these were cult movies. No! <laughs> it's the way he constructs a story, it's the way he adds this dreamlike nature to everything he does. No! In my mind, they're the most real films of all time. He was clever enough with the camera that he could take what was around and turn it into cinematic art. If Baba had been making pictures in the United States or even in England, Baba today would be known as the equal of Hitchcock. Mario Baba. El maestro de lo macabro. Mario Baba dirigió películas de casi todos los géneros y estilos. Pero a la hora de su muerte, su reputación era la de un simple director eficiente. Hoy se lo considera como un pionero de la cinematografía, un estilista visual único y un maestro de efectos especiales. Una generación entera de cineastas reconoce que Baba fue su mayor inspiración e influyó en su trabajo. ¿Quién era Mario Baba? ¿Y por qué su arte tardó tanto en recibir el reconocimiento que merece? Mario Baba nació en San Remo, Italia, en 1914. Su padre Eugenio, originalmente un escultor, ascendió en el negocio del cine desde creador de efectos especiales a director. De niño, Mario pasaba muchas horas felices viendo cómo su padre creaba efectos en su taller. He would have different chemicals lying out on the tabletop. Uh, and Baba said that he always had to be careful when he was around these things because they would be like cyanide and other things like that lying around. The children should not be anywhere near. But uh, he said the big concern was to keep that stuff out of the salad when they were uh, making dinner. Desde muy joven, Baba mostró algunas características que luego se reflejaron en su carrera. He played a, a very bad game to his mother when he was uh, like 13 or something like this and he had all these pieces of sculptures around the house so he was taking um, uh, a marble uh, foot and then he was in bed and he was calling the mother I don't feel my feet, can you please touch it? So she put the, you know, the her hand under the, the cover, the blanket and she would feel a marble and <laughs> so she, she was scared and he was laughing so that tells you a lot about his spirit he was trying always to Uh, make jokes about fear. A medida que fue creciendo, Mario desarrolló un fuerte interés por seguir el oficio de la familia. Mi padre, ya a 14, 15, 16 años, como diseñaba, aveva, era, diseñaba muy bien. Mi padre, y entonces, los primeros cartones animados los diseñaba mi padre, ya a 14. Después, de ahí, invece, como todos nosotros, a una cierta edad, 18, 19 años, se volvió a destacar del padre y comenzó a andar a hacer como asistente, operador, cosas del género, film en giro, insomma. Después de ser aprendiz de asistente de cámara en muchas producciones, Baba aprendió el oficio de camarógrafo a principios de los años 40. 
se ganó una notable reputación como camarógrafo e iluminador para muchos grandes directores, incluyendo a Roberto Rossellini, G.W. Pabs y Raúl Walsh. Pero ¿cómo era Baba como compañero de trabajo? Carlo Rambaldi, quien luego ganó un Oscar por los efectos especiales de E.T., recuerda a Baba muy bien. Era un po', aveva un po' il carattere del padre, sempre allegro, sempre... <coughs> non l'ho mai visto innervosito per quello che faceva, anzi era sempre di buon umore anche lui il figlio, Mario, molto simpatico. Era una figura mite, tranquilla, non alzava mai la voce, e amava giocare a carte. Durante le pause della lavorazione sul set lui stava sempre a giocare a bazzi cascopa con i suoi macchinisti. E persona molto divertente che amava gli scherzi. Lui raccontava che quando era giovane, essendo troppo magro, aveva paura che il vento lo portasse via. Allora si metteva dei sassi pesanti nelle tasche per non volar via. A Mario Bava le encantava bromear con il miedo. E curiosamente, sua prima vocazione fu la pintura. Así que él no filmaba ninguna escena si antes no la había dibujado. Después de la pausa, conversaremos con Joe Dante, el productor de los Gremlins la vida y las películas de Mario Baba. Como camarógrafo, Baba desarrolló una estrecha relación de trabajo y de amistad con el popular director Ricardo Freida. They began to talk about future projects, and Freida was very interested when he accompanied Baba to his home one night to find a lot of wax sculptures. Uh, Eugenio, uh, Mario's father, was a sculptor and sculpted likenesses of the saints for local churches and so on. And it's interesting that this coincides with the time that House of Wax was released theatrically. The contrast of the film's popularity and Freda seeing these wax figures made something click and they began to think about making the first horror film in Italy that had been done since the silent days. Las películas de terror no eran bien vistas en Italia desde la época de Mussolini. Pero las cosas empezaron a cambiar y Baba colaboró con Freida cuando hizo la primera película de terror moderna italiana, El Vampiri o El Mandamiento del Diablo, en 1956. Y Caltiki, el monstruo inmortal, dos años después. Freida admite que Baba dirigió mucho de Caltiqui. De hecho, la carrera oficial de Baba como director estaba por comenzar. En 1959, Hammer Films, ubicado en Inglaterra, tuvo su primer éxito mundial con el lanzamiento de su primera película de Drácula. Este éxito reencendió un enorme interés en el potencial comercial del terror y condujo a la primera oportunidad oficial de Baba para dirigir su propia película. En el 17th century, Satan was abroad on the earth, and great was the wrath against those monstrous beings thirsty for human blood, to whom tradition has given the name of vampires. En 1969, Mario Bava comenzó su carrera como director con la extraordinaria obra Domingo Negro. En su primera película creó lo que al fin fue reconocido como un gran clásico. Italian, I, I, honestly, the first Italian horror film that I saw was uh, was Black Sunday, which I think is pretty much the case uh, with most people my age. Oh, oh, I shall return to torment and destroy throughout the night of time. It's a quantum leap in terms of, of intensity because the uh, the violence level became quite extreme. And it had a whole different feel to it. Uh, the costume design, the whole, the whole basic feel of the, of the scenes were different. 
and they hit were theatrical in a very odd way, but they were very un-American and, and intriguing. Domingo Negro, la aterradora historia de una bruja vampiro, también introdujo a una de las más grandes actrices del cine de terror italiano, Barbara Steele. Steele was the first actress to play a monster in a film that was equally compelling and attractive and horrific and repulsive. Uh, the scene where she's awakened in her tomb and she's lying there scratching her nails against the tomb, you see her chest heaving, it's, you, it's erotic but it's also repugnant. tejido de sexualidad morbosa y violencia patológica de Domingo Negro se volvió el sello del estilo de dirección de Baba. The mixture of eroticism of sex uh, of horror and starkness of image to me is more real than like what people would consider realistic films just because it, it just somehow it bypasses your mind and goes right inside of you and you're not even quite sure and there's something to me about things that cannot be just simply and quickly identified and that are powerful as the most meaningful things of all Tim Burton que hizo varias películas que reflejan su interés en el género del horror fue uno de los muchos directores que fueron inspirados por el trabajo de Baba. Esto se ve claramente en la leyenda del jinete sin cabeza. There's a, a moment in Sleepy Hollow which uh, I think goes beyond homage into imitation. Uh, the scene where um, Ichabod Crane's mother in a, in a flashback is uh, uh, locked into a, a, an Iron Maiden and comes out with uh, scar holes in her face exactly like the ones Barbara Steele has. horror marathons it was one in los angeles all weekend where you just sit there for like 48 it was like 50 some hours of, of horror films and you're sort of wafting in and out of consciousness and the one film i remember out of that whole weekend was black sunday because it was like a dream and he really captured like film as dream you know Barber's work is a very studio-based look, absolutely non-naturalistic, which feeds into a celebration of the unreal. Now, in that, in that studio-based context, he's trying to evoke the great natural outdoors, but we never actually go outdoors. We're always in an enclosed and confined space. El éxito de la película lanzó la carrera de Baba como director a la cima. Esto lo estimuló para explorar nuevos temas y técnicas, muchas de las cuales recién ahora son reconocidas como adelantadas a su época y que influyeron en el desarrollo del terror. Después del éxito de Domingo Negro, Sam Erkoff, director de los estudios American International Pictures, quien distribuyó muchas películas de Baba en los Estados Unidos, lo invitó a Baba para que fuera a trabajar para ellos. El 
problem is if Barber had gone to America, he wouldn't have been going to America in the way that Hitchcock went to America. Hitchcock went, of course, to direct big studio movies for David O. Selznick, whereas uh, Barber would have gone to direct uh, cheap movies for Sam, well, Sam Arkoff for the AIP people. Uh, Mario didn't know much English. He knew more than he thought he did, but he didn't really uh, talk much in English. He understood what we were saying. He didn't feel he'd be at home here. He was an Italian. I saw him, uh, he told me that I had to learn English <laughs> because uh, he felt that if he had known this language, maybe he would have um, been more famous or he would have uh, gone to America. That was one of his dreams, I think. You know, you can look at some of the films that European directors made here and say, well, they never should have gone to America. And others saw the country in a completely new way and sort of reinvented, you know, what we were seeing. So I, I think it would have been a very interesting film, whatever it was that he would make over here. But I, I, am I sorry he didn't come? I don't know. Is it, was it a good thing that he didn't come? I don't know. Baba hizo más obras maestras en el estilo gótico a lo largo de su carrera. Sábado Negro, hecha en 1963, mostró a Boris Karloff en una representación aterradora, la cual se repitió en una trilogía pavorosa. After the success of Barber's Black Sunday, he was asked to select another story by Tolstoy to make a film from. He actually selected three stories, uh, only one of them by Tolstoy, uh, to make a three-part horror movie called, ostensibly called, Three Faces of Fear. What actually happened was American International said, yeah, this is great, we'll make this with you, but we want it to be called Black Sabbath because they wanted to cash in on Black Sunday. Barber takes certain elements of a gothic cinematic tradition and reworks them and, and puts them in a different context. One of the episodes in Black Sabbath focuses on a vampiric figure called um, the Verdelac, a vampire who wonderfully resonantly preys on members of his own family, a vampire who must drink the blood of someone he loves. Black Sabbath is the first film f in, made in Italy which is kind of a Karloff type movie, a vehicle for him. And he does, he's different in it from his performance in some of his other movies. It's uh, rather a, a r more rough edged and, and shaggy Karloff than we're, than we're used to. Allora, perché nessuno mi viene ad abbracciare? Sono ferito. Perché mi guardate senza parlare? Mario Bava is one of those filmmakers other filmmakers really like. If you look at the films Roger Corman was making, the Edgar Allan Poe pictures uh, in the early 60s for American International at the, te at the time they were releasing Barber's movies, you see that Corman was borrowing bits and pieces. Corman is a rather intellectual director of horror, whereas when Barber was making full-out melodrama, um, as in Black Sabbath, he really goes for it. There's a real sense of the demented and the obsessional. El momento más aterrador de la película se llama La Gota de Agua. En esta escena, una mujer le roba un anillo a un cadáver. Niente. Niente. Andiamo via. Abbiamo finito. 
Ya en casa es atormentada por el mismo sonido de agua goteando que oyó en el apartamento de la persona muerta. Bob is very good at taking the ordinary and making extraordinary, taking the normal and making it the most disturbing possible thing. And the dripping tap sequence in, in Black Sabbath is the prime example of that. Anyone who's seen that sequence can't hear a dripping tap in the same way. In all these movies, the one that scares me the most is the episode of the drop of water. Still today, if there's something leaking, a drop falling from far away, I have to wake up, even if I'm sleeping, I have to wake up. I have to look for it, I have to switch it off because otherwise I cannot sleep. El tormento de un grifo goteando es simplemente una señal de algo mucho peor que vendrá. Se dice que a Baba le interesaba más crear efectos visuales e imágenes impactantes que la narrativa del guión. Baba's films to me are probably closer to the unconscious than most examples of um, uh, 20th century cinema. His films run like dreams. That's because I think he, he came to the job of directing as a cinematographer. Esta peculiaridad de Mario Baba se entiende si pensamos que él estudió bellas artes por su gusto, por la fotografía y la pintura. Muchas veces estaba más preocupado por los efectos especiales que por la narración del guión. Hacemos una pausa y ya venimos con más en Vida. Otro italiano del horror, Mario Baba en Vida. Una de las raras ocasiones en que Baba trabajó en los exteriores de Italia, creó otra obra maestra gótica, Sangre del Barón. Se filmó en un castillo de Austria. Alfredo Leone, quien produjo muchas películas de terror de Baba, recuerda bien aquel momento. Baba nunca quería dejar de Italia, como you know. Y yo lo llevé a Viena. Y vimos todo el castillo en Austria y en Germania. And the, uh, at that time, it was a co-production deal with uh, Ween Film. We looked, and uh, we couldn't find what we really wanted. Until the uh, gentleman from Ween Film says, okay, I know what you want. It was right outside of Vienna. It was a museum, magnificent. Just one piece of furniture alone was worth two million dollars. And when I got that castle for Baba, He actually hugged me and kissed me. He says, Leone, this is fantastic. En Sangre del Barón, Joseph Carton personifica a un noble austríaco cuyo castillo ancestral se está convirtiendo en un hotel de lujo. Carlton también hace el papel del antepasado reencarnado del barón que quiere volver a usar la vieja sala de tortura. 
I'm particularly pleased with the meticulous and exacting restoration of this dungeon. With a little imagination, you should be able to envision the torches and hear the screams that echo through here. recorded screams in the Baron's day were real. Ours, perhaps. I knew of his talent. He displayed that. I was fascinated by, you know, because we used to fly the rushes in from Rome to Vienna, and we'd screen them. And when I saw the footage, it was just, just overwhelming. And I was on the set with him every day. He'd storyboard every night. Every night he'd come to me and say, Leone, let's, you know, show me the scene. He'd set up the camera, all the shots, and he'd ask for my input. You see, we never had a conflict on the set. I'd frequently go to him and whisper in his ear and say, you know, Mari, what do you think of that? He'd say, I just thrown some Americano. And then he'd come back to me, he says, you know, I like that idea. What did you say? And we'd talk about it. He says, that's pretty good. Let's do it. He'd use a lot of tricks. One trick in particular that he fascinated me by, he'd set up his Mitchell when you see the witches and amongst the fire. Which is a trick shot. He set his Mitchell in one end, the regular camera in another end, and then he had a reflector. And he had uh, Radarasimov stand in a certain position so that when it all came together, she was standing amidst the fire. And he said to me, where do you see this? Where do you see this? Of course, I didn't know what the heck he was doing at that time. Oh, the Baron. And the Baron shall suffer. Shall suffer. La experiencia con los efectos especiales que Baba heredó fue un beneficio enorme para el tipo de películas que hizo. La gente hoy está asombrada con los resultados que lograba siempre con un bajo presupuesto y sin la ventaja de una computadora o efectos digitales. Baba worked on Keltiki the immortal monster and helped create the special effects which basically was just a, a big pile of cow intestines with, a, with a, some poor guy in a mac underneath making it move. <laughs> and they got it to breathe simply by exposing it to electrical wiring. Kaltiki was uh, sometimes moved by tilting a miniature set in, in a pace with the camera so that it would look like the blob was moving upstairs. set up. He says, tell me what you think. So I went up on the, he had a little platform, and I went up and I looked through the lens. I couldn't see a damn thing. It was out of focus. Now, hanging in front of the lens, he had what he wanted, what you look at, and you say, wow, what a beautiful set. But it was only little cutouts and little dolls to give you the effect that that was in the room on the set. It was just tremendous. But I couldn't see that. It was out of focus. So he said to me, what do you think? I said, I don't want to show him that I was stupid or anything. I said, well, I think it's fine. The shot is good. And he turned around, I saw him going, Strons Americano, you know. <laughs> that was typical. Hoy reconocen a Baba por haber sido el pionero de un nuevo género de terror. Uno que se conoció como Yalo. Yalo literalmente significa amarillo y se refiere al color de una serie de libros espeluznantes muy populares en Italia. Eran específicamente de terror italiano. Ponía el énfasis en los aspectos más violentos y llamativos de la historia. Estas historias muchas veces incluían asesinos en serie misteriosos que atacaban a víctimas generalmente femeninas. El Ojo del Diablo, hecha en 1962, fue la primera película inspirada en el Yalo. 
Se trata de una turista que va a Roma y se mezcla en una serie de asesinatos no resueltos solo para descubrir que ella misma será la próxima víctima del asesino. El protagonista masculino era John Saxon. Horror films, I think, starting somewhere in the 60s, replaced the western as a as a staple. But before that, I I never I never done a horror film or what was supposed to be a horror film. I realized that the film was a kind of brillante horror film, a comic bri uh, horror film, what they were attempting. At least that's the version that I was acting. I don't know if there was another one. You know, there's jokes uh, and, and stuff going on. Las piezas filmadas con mucha elegancia centrándose en los métodos sádicos del asesinato y en un asesino misterioso casi inhumano han definido la misma esencia del yalo. He's given birth to the stalk and slash film, which, which so clearly displays woman as victim and man as violator. He draws very um, close comparisons between violence, death, and sexuality. Um, sex in Bava is very often kind of deadly and deathly. Death is very often sexualized. Una de las escenas que más se destaca en estas películas es una larga secuencia de suspenso en la cual la víctima es perseguida por el asesino hasta que se encuentra con una muerte gráfica y elaborada. I think he had an effect upon American uh, directors of horror. I remember Scorsese, who did his first picture for us. Scorsese appreciated Baba's work, and as a matter of fact, even discussed with me uh, doing a horror picture on his own, which he never did do. When The Last Temptation of Christ came out, it was pointed out to Scorsese that uh, he had used a little girl to play the devil, and, and it was said that, ah, you did it like uh, Fellini in uh, Toby Dammit. And he said, no, no, I did it like Mario Bava in Kill Baby Kill, uh, which is where Fellini got the idea of the, the devil as a little girl. Well, when I got a chance to make my first picture for Roger Corman, uh, which was a comedy, I figured it might be my last chance to make a movie at all. And so I inserted into the middle of this picture this long homage to Mario Bava with this masked killer in leather running around this, this uh, old western town with lots of lights and, and shadows and fog and stuff and I spent the whole night shooting all this stuff because it was so cool and I hardly even had any time for the murder at the end because I was spending so much time on it. And, and it was wildly out of place in the movie but I just couldn't let anything from me go without some acknowledgement of the fact that Mario Bava was one of my favorite filmmakers. <laughs> I think there's a very thin line between plagiarism and homage. Um, look at Bay of Blood and Friday the 13th back to back, and you might even think that Friday the 13th was filmed on the same set.
anybody who really did any work in the horror genre in the 80s owes a huge debt to Mario. He, um, he's, his, most of his work is, is very seminal. I know that in several of the Friday the 13th uh, sequels that they drew extensively from stuff that he had created and, and um, uh, made really work. He was a, he was a pioneer in, in an awful lot of this stuff. everyone knows about the American stalk and slash film is if you have sex you die if you don't have sex you don't die <laughs> that doesn't happen in Barva's films people have sex or they don't they all die <laughs> Con una serie de películas que enfatizaron los estados psicológicos enfermos y llevaban al límite la violencia. ¿Cuánto de esto se reflejaba en la psicología y personalidad del director? Ah, lui era molto gioioso, era all'antipodo de, 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 del prodotto que faceva, voglio dire. No era un tenebroso, invece lui faceva tutti questi film. Era un piccolo Hitchcock italiano. He said, why am I speaking about the dead? Because he said, in life there's only two sure things. One day you, you, you're going to be born and then you're going to die. So, about, uh, you know, how you get born, it's quite, quite easy. <laughs> and then there's nothing, nothing interesting in telling that. Instead, in, nobody is so much interested in uh, speaking about the dead or even the aesthetic of the dead. So too many people speak about love, so maybe I can uh, put together love and dead. Mio padre, da, soprattutto dalla parte delle donne della famiglia mia, erano tutte molto cattoliche. Mia nonna, calcola che l'unica sorella di mio padre che è ancora viva, tra le altre cose, aveva 86 anni, è monaca. Quindi c'era già questo rapporto un pochino strano tra cinema e, e, e religione, no? Capito? Mia nonna, io mi ricordo che era da piccolo, eh, quando andavo in giro con lei, eh, mi portava ogni chiesa che trovavamo dovevo entrare dentro. Nadie mejor que el hijo de Baba para explicarnos de dónde venía esa fascinación de su padre por lo sobrenatural y lo terrorífico. Después de la pausa, vamos a conocer la película de Mario Baba que fue inspiración para Alien. Ya venimos con mucho más en Vidas. Mario Baba, el maestro italiano del terror y el erotismo. La carrera de Mario Baba no se limitaba al terror. También trabajó en las populares películas de espadas y sandalias. Cuando estas perdieron su popularidad, la industria italiana del cine empezó a hacer los Spaghetti Westerns. Baba también dirigió varias de ellas, pero se sentía más incómodo dirigiendo en espacios abiertos que en el estudio donde podía tener más control. Y este control se vio claramente en la película Planeta de los Vampiros. Como sugiere el título, Planeta de los Vampiros no solo es una película de terror, sino una obra de ciencia ficción. They fought and killed each other off. It was profoundly influential on the look of Ridley Scott's Alien. None of this, this madness that has touched some of us, none of this is coincidence. This was planned. We might say that just as Friday the 13th can be read as almost a remake of Bay of Blood, so Alien can be read as an American big budget remake of Planet of the Vampires. Planeta de los Vampiros se desarrolla en un ambiente espacial siniestro, 
y une su concepto de ciencia ficción con la sensibilidad gótica de Baba. My guess is that Ridley Scott had not seen Planet of the Vampires, but that Dan O'Bannon and Ron Shusett, who wrote the original script for Alien, had. And of course, when they wrote that script, they were imagining it was going to be a, yeah, a pretty decent, cheap action movie. Um, they didn't know it was going to be, uh, become a big budget film directed by a real director and be a major hit. Uh, so they quite cheerfully just lifted the idea outright from a film they assumed nobody had ever seen. I do not know who came up with the title Plan uh, Planet of the Vampires. I cannot even remember what my title was. I think it was something like The Outlaw Planet or something, or The Haunted Planet, I've forgotten, something like that. Sam, Sam Arkoff, came to me and says, we have a script, there are 17 writers on it, they're all Italians, and we can't make head or tail of it. Take it, see what you can do with it. So I took it and I couldn't make head or tail of it either, but the idea was there. So I took the idea and wrote the script, which had, um, I think, about 14 or 15 different titles before it finally became Planet of the Vampires. I think that he emphasized mood rather than action. There was, of course, action in it, but most of it was mood. There's almost no planet. It's all done with, you know, looking through the backs of old Fords and things. It, is, um, it's, it, was, it was very exciting then, and, and it still is very impressive now. Como en la película Alien, el espacio de Baba también era un lugar que daba miedo. Se puede decir que por algunos aspectos de la historia de la película y su diseño, fue la precursora de la exitosa película de Ridley Scott. When you think that Ridley Scott spent a lot of money making Alien, big budget movie, huge sets, top cameraman, the, the works, and um, what Barber achieved with Planet of the Vampires, considering the, the, the minuscule budget that he was working on, it was quite amazing. And it, you can take some scenes of Planet of the Vampires, place them side by side with some scenes from Alien, and they're very, very similar indeed. It's hard to believe that Ridley Scott wasn't influenced in some way by the Barber movie. Both Barber and Ridley Scott present the scenes um, in, a, in a way that sort of preci precisely prevents us from uh, seeing what we really want to see. Uh, no! Don't fire! Salas. Kia. Yes, Mark. It's us. It's us. The use of strategies like mist and um, lighting which conceals as much as it reveals and um, a design which doesn't give you the whole picture. In Planet of the Vampires and in Alien, it's often very difficult to get a clear sense of scale. So we don't very clearly know what the monster is or what the proportions of the monster are because we often can't very clearly see how the humans relate to their environment. films feature the characters stumbling upon an alien life form which seems to have been there for an awful long time. It's a fossilized entity. We're not entirely sure how to read its kind of bodily geography. But the scenes are very similar. The way that that alien body is set up is, is uh, you know, a direct reference across and between the two films. Look how pitted and scarred the hull is. Doesn't look like any ship I've ever seen. Do you think it belongs to the Orions? I doubt it. I doubt if the Orions ever built any spaceships. If they had, <gasps> we would have... Look, Mark! It's three times the size of us. And judging by the deterioration of the calcium, it must have been here a long time. Probably belonged to an ancient civilization. 
The reason that Planet of the Vampires continues to be interesting is because although it's very cheap and cheerful, very um, sub-Edward at times, it's also driven by astonishingly interesting ideas about hybrid identities and the kind of subversion of selfhood through possession and inhabitation by um, another will. En los años 70, la salud de Baba comenzó a declinar y sufrió un colapso. En los años siguientes, disminuyó su trabajo. Pero en 1974, con Perros Rabiosos, una película de crímenes y casi la última de su carrera, Baba demostró que aún era capaz de sorprender al público con sus habilidades. Solo hizo una película más antes de su muerte, en 1980. Como muchos grandes artistas del pasado que fueron dejados de lado en vida, finalmente hoy Mario Bava recibe el reconocimiento que merece. I think now that we're starting to see his films in proper prints, and now that the people influenced by him are owning up to it, as it were, um, he is starting to look like the you know, real master of, of uh, cinema, that, we, that those of us who've been following his career always thought he was. It's a shame that, it, that you know, it had to wait this long for, for Baba to be discovered for what he was, but I think on, on video, and certainly the people who are rediscovering it, uh, there's a lot of, um, a lot of excitement about being able to, to see these pictures often for the first time. I think that Baba's legacy as a director is that he shows how much can be accomplished if you have the desire to accomplish it. All you need to really know is the mechanics of cinema and you can create magic. Now I think he's still alive. I mean, <laughs> although 20 years have passed, I think he's always with me and with my family. Oh boy, it's tough to put it all in one word. His, his kindness, his brilliance, his talent, his love for his fellow man and respect for life and people. I can't think of anybody better where, where images are the story. The vibe and the feeling is what it's about, you know, and it's not literal. It's not something that, 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 that follows stories traditionally. But when an image stays with you that strongly, that's a story. Mario Bava falleció en 1980, después del debut de Macabro, la ópera prima de su hijo Lamberto. Y en vida, este maestro italiano también utilizó los seudónimos de John Fom, Mickey Lyon y John Ault. Será hasta la próxima.